sound bite. Uh, I'm smiling because Chris, there's nobody in this room who has a heart bigger challenge than you in that regard. I mean, if you're talking about getting used to the 21st century, I, we're all getting used to the 21st century. And it seems to me the whole notion of the newspaper and the whole notion of how one reports, mm. that's what's really, no, seriously. I mean, you know, I go into a, uh, into a room with John Hondrick and I feel great because I figure he's got bigger problems than I do, you know, in terms of trying to figure out how his product and his way of being in the world is changing because of technology, because of shared learning, because of the way in which we think about civic Absolutely. space and all of that. I mean, it, it's all up for grabs. But you know, I mean, these changes we're talking about, they're happening right now in this, in this library. Uh, they're happening at the University of Toronto. They're happening at Sheridan College, George Brown. I mean, this is part of a much larger um, change that's happening about opening up uh, people to an experience. But, Matthew and Janet, it's time to go to the audience and get some questions. <laughs> Because I've monopolized you for way too long. You have to just shout your question into the, into the, into the microphone there. Or else we won't be able to hear you. Yeah, right there. I'm worried about this guy who's coming to ask a question. I don't know him, but I saw he was taking notes. He was actually, he was actually listening to us, Janet, like we could be in big trouble here. In the third minute, you said... So uh, you don't know what I was writing there. I could be doing Sudoku. <laughs> you, maybe you lost me in the third minute. Um, so here's the question. I used to work at the CBC until recently, and, and I can tell you that all the conversations that you've been having up there uh, they've been having forever. And many of the things that Matthew said, uh, my boss, Richard Sturzberg, used to say all the time, what's wrong with being popular? Aren't we supposed to have an audience? Um, and, but I can also tell you that the CBC is actually one of the most hated institutes, uh, institutions by lots of people because of many of the things that Christopher said. So it's a struggle, the, the balance between um, being an institution that is a public a public service institution, um, and also not being seen to be too elitist, but not being seen to be too populist, blah, blah, blah. My question is not that, <laughs> but rather um, you touched on something that really interests me because I ran digital at CBC as well. And, and uh, a lot of the most interesting work I see around museums is um, Brooklyn Museum, for example. And they, they, most of the work that they do is in the digital sphere that's very different. So. They allow people to um, visit digitally. They allow them to curate digitally. So for example, Matthew, um, one thing you can't do at the art gallery is uh, submit your own art, or curate art, or put your own collections together, or share information with other people that like the same kinds of things that you like. And this is all stuff that um, Brooklyn Museum does, for example, or the Walker Institute. <clears throat> so could you just speak a little bit about that, how, how important that is to you? Because um, what happened to Brooklyn was, they did not get larger gross numbers, but they had um, a much younger audience and a much more diversified audience by doing that. Sorry, I've got a sort of semi-throat problem. Um, I'm completely conflicted about the question you asked because I think back to Chris's first point, I don't think the Brooklyn Museum has done honor to the objects in its collection to the degree that it should. So I'm here uh, declaring my completely conflicted feeling about how you pay honor to the object. I don't think that they have used their collection in ways that really uh, reinforce the experience of looking. What they have done is they've done something extraordinary in the experience of sharing. And I think they've done it at a very high level. And I do think long term, that's very important to the future of museums. And uh, it's not entirely true that we have not done curate your own projects, although we've done it on a very specific uh, educational basis. I do think it's a high goal for us to be able to do that more broadly. We're, um, we are uh, hampered. Uh, now here I'm gonna make a mistake by saying this out loud, but we are uh, hampered to a degree by some of our copyright legislation that uh, in fact, in the spirit of protecting the artist actually uh, works against the notion of creating sharing communities. So there's been no more power, and I work in an art museum, so I see images all the time. There's no more powerful image for me in my imagination from the last six to eight weeks than the image in the square in Cairo during the demonstrations of people holding up their cell phones and taking photographs because that image was not about 
um, legacy or it wasn't about history. It was about sharing. It was about creating community. It was about creating knowledge by creating a network of meaning. And uh, I agree with you that the AGO has to get further along that line. Uh, when we opened up in 2008, we made the judgment that we would allow the use of cell phones in the gallery. And I can tell you that some of the trustees thought that we had lost our mind. We've had very, very few uh, complaints. But we have had a lot of people take out their cell phones to make a phone call, do this, that, and the other, try and take a photograph and be told very quickly that they're not allowed to do that. So my frustration is, and they can't do it because of copyright legislation. <clears throat> so my frustration is we say to people, come to the art museum, it's your home. Come to the art museum because we want you to feel comfortable there. Come to the art museum because it belongs to you institution of the, for the people of Ontario. But by the way, as soon as you come in, change your behavior, right? So, um, you know, one of the two things that I did during Transformation AGO that the board didn't give me permission to do was, um, which I did anyway, um, was put the coffee bar on the fifth floor of the Contemporary Tower. And I did it because I wanted to create a moment when people could understand that they could act in a certain way in an art museum that was maybe different than they uh, had thought before. And I guess all, it's a long-winded answer to say, I think you're right to provoke us in the way that you are. And I think that we, we at the Art Gallery have some ways to go. I think from my point of view it's it's partly that the museum as I see it is moving away from just being a place so I think we increasingly exist in a physical space but we also exist in a virtual space as well and the, diff the main difference for that is that you can access the museum from anywhere in the world and and I think that makes a big difference to the way that we set things up and I, I think personally it's one of the most exciting areas in museums and we've got a fair amount of catching up to do at the ROM the, the emphasis was very much on the capital project no huge surprise there but now we need to work on that virtual space and it's interesting how things move very quickly and I, I think I said the other day that that you can now become invisible in ways that you didn't know you could become invisible before so when Google Art Project was created we just became invisible both the AGO and the ROM became more invisible that day than we had been before because we weren't in that space and and lots of people were expecting that we would be in that space and who knows, maybe we will be one day. But I'm also very struck that there's, there's, a, there's a simple issue about access to do with new technology. Uh, a friend of mine from the British Museum was here a few weeks ago. They now have two million artifacts online. And they say they do that because their mission is to be both the world's greatest museum and to make it available to everybody. So they see it as part of their mission to put their whole collection online. It's a laudable aim. We've got a huge way to go to be able to do that. And then, of course, as you say, it just, un it just opens a new area where you can think about what you do with that material, how you respond to it, how you make meaning out of it, how you put your own collections together. And there's one last thing I think I'd say about the, <clears throat> the way that this work in, in the virtual space is now a lot of people in museums are writing about how it's in, in changing the behaviour that people have in the physical space and, and Matthew's just touched on that. But people, people now have the ability to come into the ROM and to um, not read any of the labels that we've carefully written for them, to instead um, look at an object Google, Google on their phone, take a picture of it, blog about that to the outside world. We've actually always allowed, for in recent years, allowed people to take pictures. And, and so they can completely bypass the museum if they so wish. 
What I think they'll want to do is I think they'll still want to hear our opinion. I think they'll still want to hear about why it is that we think something is really important or really interesting. But they might want to make their own comments about it as well. And actually, I couldn't stop them now, even if I wanted to. And so I think that how we create those spaces and how that doesn't just become a morass of content that nobody's looking at is, is quite an important thing that we need to think about. And we need to think about what we might do and how we might support those conversations. Yes. Yes, with the um, uh, expression, getting the public interested in interact interacting with the museums or the art galleries, what's happening to um, research done at both institutions, uh, monies available for research, and also how do you um, uh, work with the public and say this is important too, and this is what we are doing? Can I go first? Um, <clears throat> well, research is a big part of the ROM, and we, we set big store by research, and that's why we have the curators and the experts there. And for me, it works best when you're able to make a direct translation through from the research interests of the expert all the way through to what you might see on the floor. And when we do that and it works brilliantly, it's, it's wonderful. But also, increasingly, I think we'll use new technology so that research, which we can't always turn into an exhibition or we can't always turn into a gallery, we can make that available another way. For instance, um, we have a, a great textiles um, curator at the ROM, Alexandra Palmer. And one of the things that we've talked about is just how difficult it is to display textiles because of the light and the pests and, and everything that's going on. But there are museums all over the world that are having real success in doing quite detailed research on their objects and then making them available online. And, and that's something that Alexandra's really keen to do. And so the research will be part of what makes that an area of the museum worth visiting. You know, that will be what makes it special. And so we'll be continuing um, to invest in that research and trying to make, make sure that you can take it all the way through to what the audience can experience. But, but aren't we right back where we started, where people are looking at pictures on, on slides and, and reading in textbooks and looking at their notes? I mean, surely, uh, I, I mean, I know the Louvre kind of thing where people, you know, f zip past the, the Mona Lisa, ch -ch 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 -ch, and, then, and then rush off. I mean, the, the power of the object object is so strong there that, I mean, just to have, you know, stood in front of it is, is enough for most people. But, I mean, surely that is what it is about in the end, is, is the thing itself. Without that, uh, then, then you could just be a clearinghouse of information, a university faculty or whatever. I have to say, I think that we're going to need to loosen up on what it is that people do with the objects. I think that some people might just want to look at them. Some people might see them as a source of inspiration and go on to do something else. Some people might see them as a way of, uh, of mapping their own memories onto something. They might, you know, in the way that they do, they tell me about the day that they came to the ROM and they saw a particular thing. That's as much about their story as it is about the object. I think it's something that these new technologies are changing that balance and that relationship. I don't think it's going to be for us to say you can only do these things with these objects. I mean, let me give you an example about the textiles. I mean, textiles, of course, they're wonderful to see them in, in, in the real um, spaces, but they are fiendishly difficult to display for any length of time. But um, to another Australian example, they, at the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney, they put their entire lace collection online. And what they found is the lace makers, not just in Australia, but from across the world, are using the patterns that are there online to make types of lace that haven't been made for many years, to use that as an inspiration for new types of lace making. There is a whole craft um, developing in terms of that particular community around that lace. It's not just the same as looking at it, but for me that's that collection being used, that's that collection uh, being alive. But you know, <clears throat> you say that, that looking at the object in the Louvre is the thing, <clears throat> but you have to acknowledge that research actually enhances looking. So it, research actually helps you understand what you're seeing and it sort of deepens the experience, whether it's a fake and whatever. <clears throat> so for example, we have at the moment a wonderful little photography exhibition <clears throat> where the core of the experience is actually understanding that the way in which we first understood authorship in relation to those photographs changed because of research and it's actually by another photographer and we can actually create a story around who that photographer was. That research enhances the looking and takes you back to paintings and other such things. My thought about research 
is, um, and maybe in this sense, we're a little different than the ROM, maybe, I don't know. I mean, because we're doing research all the time around objects. We're doing research all the time around audiences. We're doing research all the time about painting techniques in our gallery school. So there are lots of different kinds of research. But I'm increasingly interested in applied research. I'm not inter uh, you know, again, this goes back to the point of that the most important thing I think we do is create audiences. And therefore, I think the most important kind of research we do is that which engenders a relationship with an audience. And I'm most interested, therefore, in research that's done around creating public interchange or creates the possibility for a conversation. And I think, by the way, curators organizing exhibitions do that. If they do it at the highest level, they're creating product or experience for the public. And I push uh, curatorial staff always to think about how what their research is is benefiting the experience for the person in the galleries. So I'm, you know, there's probably a technical uh, definition of what applied research is. Uh, for me, it's about building audiences. I'm not yes. too interested in the academic, um, isolated research. Good evening. I've really enjoyed your contributions this evening. Um, I have to confess right off the bat that the AGO is an addiction of mine, although I thoroughly enjoyed traveling with the ROM on more than one occasion. The ROM, as far as I can see, does have two problems. It, I've, I've always felt that it may have an identity crisis. Is it an art gallery or is it a museum? The other problem is the expense. I really feel it was a shame to abandon the free Friday evenings, especially for families. Would you like to comment? Mm. Well, I'm glad you think we only have two problems. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's interesting, is it an art gallery or is it a museum? I think it's a museum, I have to say that. But then I'm biased, I've always worked in museums and I think that part of that is there are certainly pieces that are in the ROM because they're wonderful art, but there are also the dinosaurs and there are also the minerals. And I think that to have that range of things, I think that makes you a museum. And so my feeling is that it is resolutely a museum, and, and, but it's a museum that sometimes has art. So I, I don't have that problem, but I do think we need to think about the way that we're perceived. And I think we need some of the things that we've talked about tonight. You don't always see them at the ROM. And I think that there are things that we have to work out there. Now, in terms of the expense, it's true, a visit to the ROM is quite an expensive um, endeavour. And of course, all the things that we've talked about tonight, the research, the development, the curatorial work, all of that comes out of um, a combination of things, the money that you pay at the door, the amount of money that we get from the provincial government, and the amount that we get through phil philanthropy. And